Hi, and welcome to Axelbank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Dr. Matthew Clavin, the author of Symbols of Freedom Slavery and Resistance Before the Civil War. He's written four books and is a professor of history at the University of Houston. Dr. Clavin, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I really greatly appreciate it. Before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity that promotes children's literacy. The ultimate American contradiction is that our, fo- our, our founding documents say all men are created equal and that we're all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words, though, were written by a man who owned human beings. The ideals in those documents were the inspiration for even more propaganda, and even for the men who were fighting for the new nation, that was so. And many of those men held slaves. But Dr. Clavin argues that the glaring contradiction was harnessed by the very people who were slighted by it. Dr. Clavin When and how did you realize that the symbols of America, the documents, the flags, the national anthem, were in and of themselves inspiration for the slaves? Great question. I'll tell you, I think, and I tell this to students all the time when I assign research papers or something like that, and they all go into the the study mode, research, writing mode with the topic already prepared. And that's sort of a backwards way of doing it for historians, because if you don't find what you're looking for, or if you don't have the resources to access what you're looking for, it can make your life very difficult. I think the best history is oftentimes when you serendipitously come across something and the research sort of reveals itself to you. And then you sort of are just a vessel who tells the story, you know, narrates uh, the story. So bottom line is I've been teaching early American history for years now, and I have been writing and researching specifically about slavery, slave resistance, the anti-slavery movement, the the more radical abolition movement, all of these things. It's just over the years, it's just repeatedly, I come across all these examples. Again, this is an accidental discovery that slaves have this penchant for running away on the 4th of July, uh, plotting slave revolts for the 4th of July. I can't tell you how many times I have encountered accounts of fugitive slaves They're fighting to the death with slave catchers and bloodhounds and all these things. It's very dramatic and true. And as they, you know, fight with weapons in their hands, sometimes to the death, they cry out, give me liberty or give me death. And so the evidence kind of speaks for itself. And so I think my task has just been to almost collate these these stories, these anecdotes, and try to make sense of it. But it's really undeniable in the archive that enslaved people, that they— they, they, they all those those phrases you opened with, in addition to Patrick Henry's war, Patrick Henry's war cry, and many other sort of uh, idioms and just this rhetoric of the revolutionary period, it survives among antebellum, you know, pre Civil War uh, slave societies, say, uh, slave plantations. You open the introduction with your book with an anec- uh, of your book with an anecdote about a slave who was being marched through the capital after mm-hmm. the War of eighteen twelve. He raised his chained hands and, as far as we can tell, yelled, Hail Columbia, happy land. You say that's a great example of a symbol of American freedom being adopted by the enslaved. What did Hail Columbia mean and why did that slave harness it? I'll get to that in a second. We'll hear a little context. So from the American Revolution, the Treaty of Paris in 1783, Through the War of 1812, Americans were nominally free. They really weren't. You know, Great Britain still held a lot of control over its former colonies through its, you know, massive navy. It controlled trade. It harassed American ships. It literally kidnapped and oppressed American citizens. And this went on for years. It isn't until the United States, really at the Battle of New Orleans, crushes the British military that we we get a real sense of independence and freedom, like genuine. And this enters, you know, historians call it the era of good feelings. And people back then, someone wrote in a newspaper that this was the era of good feelings. But now we enter a period of 
an unprecedented period of super American nationalism. And so these federal holidays, 4th of July, President Washington's birthday, uh, the American flag will be standardized for the first time shortly after the War of 1812. National anthem won't be standardized for a century, but they will start to, you know, bounce around some songs and they become unofficial national anthems. So to answer your question, arguably the first great recognized informal national anthem was a song called Hail Columbia, Happy Land. It's set to the tune of God Save the Queen, the Queen or the King of all things. But the lyrics of the song are a dedication, a commemoration of the heroic sacrifice of America's founding fathers in the revolution. And the last line of that song, the un this unofficial national anthem, is a play on Henry's, it's a form of Henry's quotation, liberty or death. And so I think it's just absolutely mind-blowing that as this slave and, and other slaves are being marched in front of the U.S. Capitol in an era of supranationalism, this enslaved man, he stands up, he lifts his chained arms, and he sings the national anthem, including the lyric, give me liberty or give me death. And it probably is going to too, too far to call this the first march on Washington, but that's one way to think of it. These enslaved people marched across the Capitol. It's really, I think, an attempt by slave owners to, to, to make a mockery of this idea of Black freedom, at least. And, and, and for slaves and their allies, this is clearly making a mockery of freedom. The U.S. Capitol is already sort of unofficially nicknamed the Temple of Freedom. Mm. So this enslaved person, he understood all this. He understood this contradiction. He understood clearly the paradox of slavery in a new nation dedicated to freedom. So this is a strong political stance he takes when he does this. And, you know, here I am writing about this, you know, centuries later. But for sure, in the decades after he does this, um, abolitionists will, in their speeches, writing, text, images, they will also uh, invoke this, this incident, this march on Washington, as just an, another great example of America's failings because of slavery. The national anthem that we know today, as you mentioned and alluded to, was not around when our nation began. And just that fact alone yeah. might startle some people. Uh, yeah. Why is it important to know that symbols evolve and that the symbols that we see today might be unrecognizable to our founding fathers and mothers? Yeah, and I think it, you know, these symbols, which are so contested today, and not just simply U.S. Capitol building after what we've seen in the last couple of years, and it's not just national symbols, it's in Richmond, Virginia, it's on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, you know, all over the country, Americans are again reevaluating, reconsidering, uh, you know, the naming of schools, the standing of certain monuments, the waving of certain flags, you know, the Confederate flag comes to mind. And, you know, I think we go sometimes taking for granted what these things mean and represent to all people. But I think one of the points of my book is that these things mean different things to different people at different times. At the same time, sometimes these things are more universal than we think. And so even for enslaved people who had every right to sort of look down upon the American flag and all these symbols of freedom... I find that they embraced them frequently, nonetheless. Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. no. <laughs> Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Oh. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Where in the scholarship can you find that? How did you find slaves looking at the 4th of July, looking at the Patrick Henry quote, looking maybe at the national anthem of the time and saying, this represents me too. Is it possible to identify those things specifically in sources? Yeah, it's, and I have many examples. I'll, I'll come up with, two, I'll just do two. I could do 200. Yeah. Uh, but you know, one example is 
Uh, Charles Ball is an enslaved man. He's all over the South for decades, quite frankly. He fights in the War of 1812. He's re-enslaved. It's an incredible story. But he writes a narrative like Frederick Douglass does after he escapes from slavery. And his basically his biography is, is published. It's available online today. And he tells this extraordinary story of being bought and sold on the 4th of July one day in the early 1800s. And, you know, it's just it's so heartbreaking to read. You know, he's he's in a jail cell in the morning of the 4th of July, and there's a, a, a not a carnival barker, but a, an auctioneer shouting things out in the town square. He's eventually taken from his cell, he's presented to buyers, he's sold to the highest bidder. He's basically chained to a park bench while his new owner gets drunk in a tavern, and all these song, patriotic songs are being sung. And Ball is sitting on this bench, like basically saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, you got to be kidding me. Like this is this is America. This is the Fourth of July, and I have just been sold like an animal to the highest bidder. So that's a very profound example where he spells it out. And there's also very famously Solomon Northrup, um, another you know he's a free black man. That the movie Twelve Years a Slave is obviously this incredibly um, poignant and moving, painful portrayal um, of, of what happens to him. He's kidnapped basically. And he lives 12 years in New Orleans on a plantation and eventually finds his way to freedom. But he recounts in his narrative, which is published after he's ultimately freed, um, when he's enslaved in Washington, D.C., in this very famous slave prison. And, you know, right outside of the prison, this huge American flag is waving. And then he rem he recalls that when, when he is in that prison cell, what it meant to him, how painful it was to be in that cell, um, not only to see the flag, but just the disgrace that slavery and slave owners were bringing on that flag. So I think ultimately to answer your question, you know, a lot of enslaved people or, you know, some of them who are fortunate enough to escape, a lot of them recorded their experiences. And then you have slave owners accounts, you have newspaper accounts of just countless examples of slave resistance. And like I said, there's, there's sort of these observers who hear, you know, a, an escaping slave cry out liberty or death or they see something or hear something and it's hearsay. But when you get enough of that, it, it certainly seems to be enough evidence to make you know specific arguments. I love asking authors about their process. So I'm curious how you piece this all together. Um, you just mentioned some of the sources that you used, but as you began to unravel this story and you kind of turned these, co what you maybe thought at first were coincidental findings mm -hmm. in sources you were looking through into a cohesive narrative and into a cohesive argument, how did you begin to seek out even more sources? And then how did your research unfold? Yeah, you know, when I first sat down, I said, wow, that's a great question. Something I don't, you know, historians love to get asked. We don't get asked very often about our method, you know, and I'm very old school. I like to you know, physically be in the archives. I like to print out copies of things and compile them and organize them. And my original intent was just to tell this story, all this anecdotal evidence of how these, not only the symbols of freedom, but the language of freedom really motivated, inspired slaves. And then I increasingly, you know, found that it, it inspired specifically forceful, even violent resistance to slavery. But the more I got into it and, and the more of these primary records I compiled, I also started to see that it was even a bigger project than I initially imagined. And so there's just this whole idea of, of how do Americans in the first 50, 60, 70 years of the nation's existence, how do they deal and reckon with all these ideas, these really, quite frankly, radical ideas of equality? How do they reckon with all of this stuff? You know, the, the holidays, the monuments, the, 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 the celebrations, the national anthems, how do they reckon with this stuff given not only the existence of slavery, but the expansion of slavery in the South? So ultimately, the second half of my book is sort of this telling of the forceful resistance to slavery, not only by enslaved people, but their allies. But the whole first half, half of the book was something I didn't intend to write initially, but it's just about how Northerners and Southerners, and not just against one another, but internally, how they dealt with these, these radical ideas. And as you can imagine, Northerners interpreted the Declaration differently than white Southern slave owners. You know, they interpreted holidays differently. They interpreted, you know, all these symbols of freedom quite differently. Some of this is very clear to make any living and breathing human being, you would hope, 
deeply emotional. Um, even just listening to your accounts, I find myself getting choked up thinking about the lives that black slaves were confined to um, and consigned to in this country. Um, how did the emotion I, that I assume you felt help or hurt your ability to put together a narrative and an argument? It absolutely emboldened me. And, you know, when I study slavery and I do it for a lot of different reasons, but I go very quickly from anger to inspiration, you know, the, the and I tell students, you know, if you want to really understand man's inhumanity to man, study slavery, study the Atlantic slave trade. I mean, it is, it's, it's hurtful. It's painful. At the same time, if you dig deep enough and you don't have to dig very deep, you find that these people, despite the most extraordinary obstacles that are allied against them, enjoying any sort of freedom, or as you said earlier, pursuit of happiness, they persist, man, and they resist in every way, shape, or form. And I also find it very inspirational that periodically they find allies. It could be free Black Southerners. It could be Native Americans, you know, along Florida's Gulf Coast. It could be a white abolitionist in Ohio who periodically, you know, helps enslaved people cross the Ohio River. And so it's just, I, I tell students, and I know we're here to talk about my book, and not necessarily the way I teach, but the two overlap. And I'm just not going to devote my time and energy to telling a story that doesn't move me. And I only write about things that stir my emotions, stir my passions. And I guess I, I'm very interested in the pursuit of freedom. I'm also very you know, interested in just the, the story of American history, the idea of American exceptionalism, American patriotism, nationalism, all of these things. And they all just sort of come together in each of my projects. But for this one in particular, it really is a, an emotional tale of nationalist sentiment, you know, nationalist ideals, you know, sort of the best that the United States can represent, you know, ideologically speaking, and how some of those ideas really played a role. They're, they're like, they almost become like tangible things that, that, that get people to move, they get people to act. And so that really underscores this idea that, that symbols, the language of freedom, powerful stuff. And, there, and oh, go ahead. There's a, um, um, a scene in a book in one of Alan Taylor's books about the War of 1812, where one of the slaves who is fighting um, for the United States and for the U.S. military, um, he says, of course, we're fighting. This is our land, too. Right. How did participation in a war influence how slaves or black Americans develop their patriotism? I think, and what's what I find very fascinating, that it isn't always the U.S. flag in the 18th and 19th century that draws the attention of enslaved people. Um, the American during the American Revolution, thousands upon thousands of African Americans, North and South, who were enslaved, they fought for the British. During the War of 1812, the same thing, perhaps even more um, enslaved Americans uh, volunteered for the British. And then we get to the American Civil War, and then roughly a quarter million enslaved people volunteer for the American forces, for the Union Army. So I think enslaved people over the course of American history, they demonstrate that they are they can be loyal to not just the nation of their birth, but whichever nation offers them freedom and a chance at equality. So they have a real sort of, at least demonstrated in my book, they have a real conditional love for the United States, and they prefer the United States to be their land of their birth, but like so many escape to Canada, and they still love America. They still read American newspapers. Many Black Canadians will join the Union Army during the Civil War, yet they moved to Canada, British Canada. They wanted the protection of the British flag, and so their loyalty is extremely conditional, and it's changing. But, you know, it's it, it's they, they never sort of lose the idea that America has potential, at least. Is there a difference between the way free blacks viewed the symbols um, that we're talking about here and how enslaved blacks viewed those symbols? No, I don't see that necessarily. I, the, the one difference I do see is 
let's say, escaped slaves who become free Black Northerners or free Black Canadians, they definitely have a slightly more jaundiced view towards America symbols than white abolitionists. And these two groups agree on so much. Um, they're willing to put their lives and their livelihoods on the line to fight the good fight against slavery. But there's a lot of examples where you will see uh, Black Northerners, Black Canadians who were formerly enslaved. They definitely look more harshly on American tradition. And, you know, and the, one of the great stories of my book is John Brown, the radical white abolitionist. And before the Harper's Ferry invasion, he's in Canada and he's at this conference. There's very few white men, some of his family members, and, you know, dozens and dozens of these black abolitionists. And, you know, they all sign up basically uh, to help him, you know, get rid of slavery violently if need be, to help him invade Harper's Ferry. And they sign this document. And at one point, there's a very big debate. And Brown says, we're going to go to the South and we're going to free the slaves and we're going to arm them and, and we're going to do it under the American flag. And all these black Canadians say, nah, John, we're not going to do that. Like we, 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 we hate slavery as much as you do. We will die for it, but we're not doing it under the flag. And then there's a, a debate and it lasts only a couple of hours. And Brown eventually convinces them, you know, no, the flag was good enough for the founding fathers. It's good enough for us. And it shows you his power and, you know, black abolitionist affinity for him. And they agree to do it. But it is a very important sort of story about how black abolitionists, they're, they're a little a little more gray area to them, their love of country than someone like Brown. How did those who created those symbols, let's say those who um, drew up the first national anthem, drew up the first American flag, how did those who created those symbols deal with the obvious contradiction? Hey boy, they didn't really deal with it at all. I mean, our national anthem today, the Star Spangled Banner, and people are increasingly, they know this more today now with the internet and it's only been known among a small cohort of historians, but the original verses of the Star Spangled Banner, there, there's a verse, and it's basically this shout out, if you will, to you know escaped slaves, and it's basically mocking them for abandoning the United States and almost wishing them harm as they go to join the British. And it's, so it's basically a very staunchly pro-slavery stanza, if you will, in the, the, the Star Spangled Banner. So Francis Scott Key is, you know, Washington, D.C., Baltimore lawyer, and, and he's very much, he's kind of all over the place. But very often he comes down on the side of pro-slavery, white supremacy. And to my knowledge, there's not any great record of how he felt about, you know, that song and the, the, the verse on escaped slaves. But clearly he just doesn't quite recognize sort of the direction that the country is moving in the future. And, and him... Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, I am sure maybe they would have rolled over in their graves when they learned 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later that enslaved people were taking their words to violently fight for freedom. Um, but you can't get those words back once you say them or sing them in the case of Francis Scott Key. What did slave masters say when the words and the symbols and the songs that they sang were the same ones being sung by the enslaved? Yeah, I think silence is silence with an exclamation point. And another great anecdote from the book is this is in, right outside of New Orleans in the 1840s. There's a conflict between a group of slaves and a nasty overseer. And the overseer threatens the, the slaves who are refusing to work. And there's a gunfight. And, you know, one of the black men is shot down. And as he's fighting, he, you know, he basically taunts the overseer and says, you know, shoot me, I don't care. And he says, liberty or death. And a local newspaper puts it in print. And, you know, shockingly, this slave, you know, it cries out liberty or death. And then pretty quickly for the 19th century, the story goes viral. And newspapers all over Louisiana and eventually the country reprint the story. But every single reprint, at least across the South, takes out the sentence where it quotes the rebel slave crying out liberty or death. And so it's, they don't want anyone to even associate Black people um, with this radical ideology. Same with the 4th of July, white slave owners throughout the course of the early 19th century, they try to depoliticize the holiday. They try to make it about barbecue and foot races and all sorts of fun stuff but they really get away from celebrating those radical, you know, egalitarian ideals. Is it possible to show how the use of these symbols by slaves 
begin to have a measurable impact on the push for abolition across the country. Yes, and because these and historians have really done a great job in the last generation or so of not only showing the incredible alliance between free Black Americans and white Americans in the North and West and Upper South, but we're also increasingly recognizing how there is a direct link between enslaved people who resist their enslavement and the abolition movement. So it's not just, the abolition movement is not just free people in the North and West, it's also enslaved people. Now they're not members of abolition societies, they don't attend generally anti-slavery lectures, but they constantly commit acts of resistance. And when they do that, and it involves the symbols of freedom or the language of freedom, and Northerners and Western anti-slavery advocates get wind of this, they make a big deal about it. Mm. And they use it as a reminder you know, that, to, to remind moderates on slavery. They even try to, you know, convert pro-slavery Americans that America has a shortcoming. We have a flaw. It's a cancer and it's slavery. And in the South, we have enslaved people. They are taking the language and symbols literally. We need to respect that and we need to help them. We need to end slavery. As the Civil War got closer and then as the Civil War starts, how were those symbols used by slaves who went into battle and by free blacks who went into battle. I know your book ends, by the way, before yeah, the Civil yeah. War, but right, right. Get, get us as close as you can to it. Yeah, well, I think the, the big pivot is the Fugitive Slave Act. And I know a lot of people appreciate its significance, but I just don't think generally scholars and lay people understand what that law represented. I mean, that law is so bizarre and, and so far as the power it gives the federal government to not only re-enslave escaped people, but also potentially enslave free black people. And it you know, takes away their right to a jury trial. There's financial incentive for these federal officials to send black people to the South to live you know, their lives in captivity. And so that law, it fundamentally transforms the abolition movement. It radicalizes it. It really is going to ultimately lead to this, this whole effort of violent abolitionism. But at the same time, it really is undeniable, concrete proof of this incestuous, sinister relationship between the federal government and slave owners, what, what everyone calls the slave power. And so after 1850, as, as the Civil War approaches, Americans are not just, not just fighting over slavery and its expansion, like they're fighting over what the heck the United States is supposed to stand for. And we know Lincoln says we can't be half, you know, slave, half free, but it's even deeper than that. Like, is this going to be a country of freedom or is this going to be, is this going to be a country of equality of the declaration or is it going to be something totally different? Is it going to be a country that just makes a mockery of the symbols and language of freedom? Is all that stuff just rhetoric? Is it silly talk? Is it just, you know, for show or does any of this stuff mean anything? And it's really awesome. It's really fascinating that abolitionists eventually will take the country in their direction. And I, I tell the story often, you know, when, when Lincoln gives that Gettysburg address and he says four score and seven years ago, it is a revolutionary expression because he is invoking not the Constitution. He is invoking the Declaration of Independence. And he's really the first American president to say that our founding document, our founding text is the Declaration because of its radical promise of freedom and equality. Yeah, the Constitution is great. We respect it and we need it, but it's secondary. So the way I see it, it's like these abolitionists who were such a minority, they were such outcast. By the mid-1860s during the Civil War, the president, the government, they, they win. Like they, they, they appropriate those symbols. They appropriate that radical rhetoric. And it's not just the soldiers, but it's the government. A lot of people are now pushing towards not just you know winning the Civil War and restoring the Union, but slavery for all people. It's, it's really an incredible story. What do we need to know about how those symbols, the Declaration of Independence, the new national anthem that we know today, how were those symbols harnessed by those, and I'm not sure how much study you've done on it, but by those after the Civil War, and then as Jim Crow begins to rise, and then moving in through the Civil Rights Movement through the 1950s and 60s. Well, you know, this is getting way ahead of your, the time period you're talking about, but I was just 
writing something this morning and I'm reminded of that very, very famous photo that's won all these awards of the Boston integration crisis in the 1970s and that very famous picture of the white Bostonian who is opposed to integrating schools through the busing and he's attacking a black civilian with an American flag. And the point is, reminds me, it harkens to the fight over these symbols during the era of slavery. So to answer your question, during Reconstruction, after Reconstruction, the battle continues. And, you know, if you think of World War I and you have all these black soldiers and they're coming home from France and they have the American flag on their jackets and they're, they're being lynched. I mean, it's, it's, it's unthinkable. And then, you know, in the Great Depression and, and, and the World War II, and there's this all constantly battling over what these symbols mean. And I definitely think in recent years, you know, we've, we've seen these fights over flags and monuments and memorials. And I kind of think a lot of people think this is new, that this is different. And certainly one thing I just want to convey is from the founding of this country, it's been a nonstop battle over the meaning of these things. And there's... Not only do I think it's not going to end anytime soon, maybe it shouldn't. You know, a nation is a is a is a strange thing on some occasion. It's this imagined community, and you know the, the the parameters and what it means. It all changes, and it's up for any it's up for every generation to determine what those symbols are supposed to mean and what their country is supposed to look like. And so the battle began long ago, and it continues. How do you teach this to? your students uh, at the University of uh, Houston, right? Um, right? When you have a high school kid who comes in and says, stand for the flag, I love our country, and you've got to do both in order to be a full-throated American. Right. Um, how do you begin to teach this topic to kids who have, um, to no fault of their own, preconceived notions um, and strong beliefs about what these symbols should mean? Well, I'll tell you, I try not to talk too much, and I'm a talker, <laughs> but you know, one thing the abolition movement left us is not only, you know, countless pages of speeches, you know, newspaper articles, but but the images. And I'm a visual learner. A lot of young people are visual visual learners. And thank goodness through Google, you can, you know, and I'm and I'm so thankful for New York University Press. They allowed me to put over 20 images in the book of all these, you know, the, the evocations and invocations of the American. I, I was thankful for that. W without some of them, it would have been more difficult yes. to follow. I appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and so it's really cool. And so I like to just, you know, I use PowerPoints and I sometimes will, you know, we'll go over speeches and yeah, newspaper articles. But when you put a pic that, that, that incident we discussed earlier, when you put up that picture of a slave coffle in front of the U.S. Capitol and the protest song is sung, students will talk endlessly about it. Um, when you show the, there's pictures in the book of these slave coffles out West where slaves are being marched from the upper South to the deep South during the, you know, the, the rise of King Cotton. And they are literally being forced to carry a U.S. flag. And, and, you know, it's hurts me to see that picture. And I can kind of get that from students as well. So just the, the abolition movement, they, they have provided all sorts of study materials and teaching materials that I find real fodder for, for good critical discussions of U.S. history and, and, and the country. How did you um, approach this, uh, uh, sorry, how did you approach writing this book as a white man, as somebody who just simply will not experience the type of prejudice that we're talking about in this book, either during slavery or after slavery? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I've done this for years now. And I can't really explain it, but I, I, like I said, I do think there's this, there's an emotional connection I have with with people back in the day who resisted um, inequality and bigotry and oppression, and I certainly can't relate to enslaved people, and I can't even relate to an abolitionist of any race, color, or creed who put their life on the line in the 19th century. Um, but I do, and I have since I was little, find. I get very angry and disgusted by racism, um, discrimination, bigotry of any kind. So the best I can do as a, as a historian, a white middle-aged historian, is to just sort of try to be as objective as possible. But when on occasion I embrace my own sort of what I bring to the table, my own sentiments, and I just try to use that as motivation to write a, a, a clear and concise story 
um, that's accessible to the masses. You know, I try not to just write for historians, um, you know, experts in the field. I think it's a problem today that historians don't write accessible enough history. And I think, you know, students, readers, school teachers, uh, history buffs, I think everyone should read not only this story, but just the story of, of, of slavery in America, um, nationalism in America, uh, race in America, because these things matter. And, and whether the historian is black, white, um, Asian, Indian, Hispanic, I mean, it matters. Um, but what really matters is, the, is the, the story that's being told on all these pages. For those of us who are living today now 150 years since uh, 100, I'm not great at math. I'm, that's why I'm a reporter. <laughs> 160 years since slavery ended in the United States. Um, what do we need to keep in mind? Um, how do we put our tentacles up to recognize when a symbol is becoming dangerous? Man, that's a great question. Well, I am not hesitant to say that I'm I'm fearful of, of not only the current political climate, as many people are, I'm fearful of the future. We've never had an election, you know, threatened to be overturned or attempted to be overturned violently. Um, we have never seen, um, let's say the American flag has been sort of appropriated oftentimes in recent history by a group of people who I do not share values with. And I think a lot of Americans don't share values with. And, you know, I think, you know, the history of Christianity and today Christianity is, you know, people know about the Christian right. Uh, they know that they know of the ways that Christianity is used towards conservative purposes oftentimes. But I like to teach and tell the stories of the radical Christian left and Martin Luther King and William Lloyd Garrison and all these radicals who used Christianity to fight literally for equality. And by the same token, nationalism, I and mean, it can be used to support and, you know, uh, buttress racism, white supremacy, imperialism, colonization, all these horrible things. But at the same time, I have found that nationalism can be used to promote democratic um, revolution, uh, egalitarian ideology. And so these symbols, like I said, are, are, are plastic almost, they're flexible, and, and, and who controls them or appropriates them um, or deploys them, it really matters, man. It makes a big difference. And especially as 4th of July approaches, and I see all throughout my neighborhood, flags popping up everywhere, um, flags online, flags in the grocery store circular. Um, you know, what does that flag mean to people? Well, it varies, and, and it, but it's important. What are your favorite or least favorite symbols that you see today, that we all see today? One of my least favorite symbols. Or favorite, you know, or favorite. Or favorite. What, what, uh, what makes you feel good? What makes you feel icky? What What are the you know emotions you have when you see different things around there that stand for different parts of America? Well, I'll give a shout out to a historian named Jack Davis in Florida who- uh, Oh, yeah. It. I just read his uh, yeah. book about the Gulf. Yeah. Well, listen, that is- that that yeah, that's well, no, him, yeah, right? That's, that's one of the best books. I've, and I spent years in the golf. I taught at the University of West Florida for five or six years. But that's one of the best books I've read in the last decade. No lie, maybe number one. But he has a more recent book on the on the bald eagle. And so I read that recently. And I can't explain it. I, I, I've only seen one or two bald eagles in my life. Uh, I'm not a bird watcher, but I've, since I was a kid, <laughs> I don't know how many I've seen because I've never looked. Yeah, I had one almost hit me when I was jogging about 15 years ago, early one morning. Right. It, it, was, it was crazy. That thing impresses me. It just really does. And when his and I always thought maybe I'd write a book about the the eagle and the patriotism, and Davis stole it from me. Um, but I was very <laughs> I was really excited as I researched and wrote this book how the American eagle was contested, and how abolitionist. It's really it's a really neat story. A lot of pictures where many Americans just see this eagle and they portray it as this, you know, symbol of freedom. It's, it's flying, nothing can, you know, cage it. But abolitionists depicted it as a predatory bird, which it is. And they would show this bird attacking an enslaved person trying to escape. And so for me, when I, and again, I've only seen a couple in, in live and in person, but even when you see a TV commercial or you see something on online and I see an American eagle, like that to me is an impressive thing. And and for the United States, that was a hell of a decision centuries ago to say, we're going to make that our emblem, our national bird. That was that was a good decision. I guess those of us who live around the Gulf of Mexico have to have read Jack Davis's book, right? Or um, you got to leave if you don't. Yeah, that's, that's right. incredible. Right. 
Um, why do you think your books flow this way from, I never say his name right, Toussaint Louverture, is that how yeah, you say it? Yeah, right. yeah, Toussaint, yeah. Toussaint Louverture, Slaves in Pensacola then, yeah. and then and also the Gulf, and then Fugitive Slaves, and now Slavery and Symbolism. How do you think that flow kind of happened? You know, I, I there's a lot of different reasons, and I some of them I can't explain my attraction to, to the history of racism and the history of slavery. I've definitely met racist and heard racist things throughout my life. And even as a kid, it, it drove me up a wall. I saw roots when I was very Where did you grow up? Uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and it was very fascinating. I grew up in a very multicultural, diverse you know, part of suburban Maryland. And it really wasn't until I went into college in Philadelphia that I really met white kids my age who were racist. And so it was weird, right? So I was in the Upper South. I went to Philadelphia and I met all these white kids and they used the N-word. And so I didn't stay long at that school because I was so, so disgusted by that. I thought racism was on its way out. And I was like, no, nah, maybe it's not. So I've always been fascinated with, with racism and slavery. But, but once, you know, I guess high school, early college, when I really started reading about it, it very quickly became clear to me that people, and this is the 1890s, 1890s, I'm not that old, the 1990s, I started You're to You're not realize, that old. You're not 140 <laughs> yet. You look good for 140. Well, well, thank you. But I really started to realize that people have underestimated how much enslaved people resisted. And, you know, and I, I met people um, 10, 20, 30 years ago, and you know, they were descendants of slave owners. And they would tell me, hey, Clavin, you know, you're in grad school. What are you going to do with a history degree? Oh, by the way, my grand, you know, my ancestors, they treated slaves well. You know, my grandpappy, you know, his, his slaves were happy on the plantation. And I could give you the names of people who told me these stories, emails I have saved. And so I definitely somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm just sort of on this mission, unofficial mission to really put on paper and document that, that how much these people fought back and not always violently, not always, you know, with force and threats. And th sometimes it was just, you know, calling in sick for the day. You know, sometimes it was, you know, breaking a tool and refusing to work. Sometimes it was a cracking a joke, mocking a slave owner when they left the slave cabin. So I just think we underestimate um, the drive for equality and how much these people are willing to risk their lives for it. And, and so it's just, it's just, I always try to think I'm going to do something totally different next time, mm -hmm. but I just keep coming across more evidence of more slave resistance for, for different reasons, you know, sometimes in the United States, sometimes abroad. And I just, I'm obsessed with it and I can't really explain it, to be mm -hmm. honest. Have you decided what's next? Yeah. And very much related to this is this idea that in so many accounts of slave resistance, you might find it shocking that these fugitive slaves, these slave rebels have pistols, they have rifles, they have muskets, they have Colt 45s, they have Bowie knives, and it's just, they're everywhere. And so the more I dig into this, it's really, and again, sort of contemporary issues, but studying it in the early 19th century, this idea that America's gun culture is new is wrong. And so what I'm really looking into is the role that guns and other lethal weapons played, not only in you know, promoting slavery, which they certainly did. I find that along with whips and chains, uh, guns and knives were just as crucial uh, to the slave owning population. But these weapons also subverted slavery, because if you're an enslaved person and you can get your hand on a pistol or a rifle or a revolver, it multiplies your chance of success in resisting slavery, you know, tenfold or more. And so it's a project I'm just beginning and, um, but uh, I'm diving in head first and I, I, I'm not a gun person. <laughs> I've never hunted. Uh, I've never even fished. You know, I'm an outdoors person, but not like that. Um, but it is an amazing topic that sort of like nationalism and patriotism and American symbols of freedom, it carries resonance today. Mm -hmm. You know, America has a problem. Um, gun violence is at the top of the list, and it's a, and I will show that it's a centuries old problem. It's it's it maybe worse than ever, but it's been with us for a very long time. Mm. Sounds fascinating. Uh, looking forward to reading that one. Um, all right, I love asking authors about their dedication pages. Your dedication is to Gladys, Madeline, right. Joseph, and Joshua. You yeah. say the loves of your life. I assume that's your family, although I don't know, but I would yeah. assume. Yeah. Um, what sacrifices do families make during an author's long slog? This is the greatest question I've ever been asked. Uh, thank you for asking. 
Uh, and my daughter, who's now 22, my first book, she was, you know, in elementary school. And she was just in my office last night because I just, you know, received copies of this book a couple of weeks ago. She was in college and, and she just graduated. And she's like, so dad, it's the same dedication. Are you always going to? And I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you guys get married and have kids in the future. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I can honestly tell you, it's, I mean, it's, I wouldn't even say it's sacrifice, but they're just, and, and I, I listen to podcasts and they don't really care what I do for a living. You know, I can imagine if I played professional sports and won the NBA championship, they wouldn't really care. You know, it's like your dad. Well, they might care about that, to be honest. Yeah, for with sure. You, but... For sure. Bring them some celebrity <laughs> and I, I, I increase their followers. Um, but I, I just don't see the sacrifice. I just see it as. And, and they just don't even, they have no idea what I do for a living. Although they, see my computer all the, they see my books on the shelves and they hear me on podcasts and things of that nature, but they really just don't understand it. But I'm just very lucky to have all four of them. And, you know, we've been this group since I was getting you know, in graduate schools when we first, my wife first had my daughter and then my son. And, it, you know, being a professor has some really, you know, some trials and tribulations, but but ultimately it's a great job to have. Um, to raise a family. So I'm a very, very lucky person. Dr. Matthew Clavin, the author of Symbols of Freedom, Slavery, and Resistance Before the Civil War. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. I, I very much appreciate the opportunity. So much fun to have you. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity that promotes children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks. <laughs>